a very good evening to all of you thank you very much for making it convenient to attend this exclusive session on behalf of the chamber a hearty welcome to ms anita mendiratta founder and president anita mm -hmm. mendiratta and associates london and special advisor to honorary secretary general united nations world tourism organization welcome to you mm -hmm. ma'am to bcic thank you very much for accepting our invitation to address at this exclusive session the session is organized under the aegis of hospitality travel and tourism expert committee the committee is led by mr vinit verma who is our vice president bcic and director brigade hospitality welcome sir the session uh, the committee is co-chaired by ms pushpa tantri program head akshara foundation and ms sanchari choudhury who is the director at ihm bangalore thank you very much and our special acknowledgement to sanchari for facilitating this session the session is moderated mr uh, by mr rajesh cha country environment and sustainability manager abb india and who also co-chairs our esg expert committee welcome sir and i thank all the chairpersons of our various expert committees and the distinguished participants for making it convenient to address, participate at this session the bcic specially acknowledges our member companies for their sponsorship for the year buller fundermax mtr iampl sdmimd sona group of companies tvs vishwas group and vipro now i hand over the platform to ms sanchari choudhury over to you sanchari thank you very much thank you so much rupa ma'am very kind words of yours and ladies and gentlemen a very good afternoon and good morning to one and all on behalf of our president bcic dr l ravindran and our expert committee of hospitality tourism and travel chairman and director brigade hospitality mr vineet verma and my co-chair ms pushpa tantri program head akshara foundation i take the opportunity to welcome the wonderful audience joining us from across the globe to attend the very special address by ms anita mendiratta who is the founder and president of anita mendiratta and associates a london based international consulting firm and special advisor to honorable secretary general of united nations world tourism organization unwto she has also been certified as fellow by the ihm international college of distinguished fellows she is a committed tourism and development practitioner working closely with leaders in governments businesses and international organizations across the tourism aviation and development sectors Ms Mandiratta is globally trusted and respected as a strategic advisor and six time published author. She began her professional career along a blue chip corporate path working in a number of Fortune 500 companies before advancing to leadership positions within one of WPP's global consulting firms. Today with over two decades of global professional working and living experiences Anita Mandiratta's hands-on cross cultural cross industry experience in both public and private sectors has created an innate ability to feel the heartbeat of societies the economic social political cultural and environmental dynamics impacting and inspiring nations facing change including confronting challenges with her exceptional skills she has proven her agility and acumen in mobilizing impact across diplomatic governmental and business spheres anita mendiritta is highly sought after as both a strategist and advisor in the areas of national growth development and often recovery she is called upon again and again to be the bridge between the government and business assisting leaders to address conflict and find common ground to enable advancement of common agendas breaking through the areas of contrast and conflict to realize shared aspirations a work in tourism and development is spread over the spectrum of destination airline airport hotels and resorts and mega event with an international reputation as a respected and trusted confidant at the highest level ms anita mandirita has become a sought after speaker moderator facilitator board member and coach for leaders and nations across the globe 
Ladies and gentlemen, we are humbled to have amongst us Ms. Anita Mandarita joining us all the way from London this morning. Ms. Mandarita would be addressing our August gathering on the topic, creating business value through sustainable marketing strategies in hospitality and tourism management. We're happy to mention a lot of young audience today, business leaders and our esteemed BCIC members who are very keen to hear her. I would also like to welcome Mr. Rajesh Jha, Country Environment and Sustainability Manager, ABP India, and Co-Chair of Environmental and Sustainability Expert Committee, BCIC, who would be moderating the session today. Ladies and gentlemen, now I invite in Ms. Anita Mandrita for the session. Welcome, ma'am. It's a truly a privilege and an honor. Thank you so much and a very loving namaskar. I'm delighted to be back in India, though admittedly it's very grey outside and very London, shall we say at the moment. Um, and I'm going to ask Sanchari, can I bother you to please pop into your email as for as much as we love doing this in our virtual world, my screen is not able to share on Teams, so I've just sent you my presentation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm I'm genuinely honored to be with you all. I'm very touched by this invitation and it is lovely as an Indian daughter to be back in India. So I thank you very much for that. I'm very grateful to BCIC and the IAHM as well. It's been lovely spending this last two years with you online. And I'm very grateful for your continued commitment to making sure that we indeed build forward better and we recover our industry thoughtfully and purposely and not instinctively by going to muscle memory of ways of the past. I carry with me the very, very special warm regards from the Secretary General of the United Nations World Tourism Organization, Zura Polalikashvili, who is a strong advocate of IAHM and therefore BC, BCIC, and really is representative of recognizing the importance of the educational community at this point in time, as it is the young people who are going to be the future of our industry who really have carried us through in terms of hope, knowing that they are prepared to be committed to staying with us in the future. So I thank you all very, very much. And Sanchari, I thank you for being my co-pilot for this presentation. Um, I'll just give you the prompt to please share a slide and if we can put on the presentation, I hope it's downloaded on that side. Brilliant, excellent. If there's one part of the world you can count on for technology transfer swiftly, it's India. So I'm very grateful for that. Stunning. So Sanchari is going to be my co-pilot. Yes, uh, Anita, ma'am, I would just like to mention we have received the file already and we're just downloading it. So I think Brilliant. it will be taking a few seconds more, ma'am, for us to basically go ahead and present it on screen. Excellent. So I will continue to talk. Um, ladies and gentlemen, yes. I've been given a very good brief by Sanchari, who's been incredible in being able to secure my time here. I thank you very much, Sanchari, for finding this gap in schedules um, and importantly, when we were working back and forth around the title of this presentation, I work in diplomacy and therefore words are critical. Every word that we use is absolutely vital. And which is why when we talk about initially it was greening marketing and greening our industry, we need to be very cautious of that word green because we know that when it comes to issues of sustainability, of diversity, of unity, everyone is talking about it not necessarily everyone is doing something about it. So what is absolutely critical is that we make sure that as we re-inspire and recover our industry, we do it in a way that is genuine, that is trustworthy, and as we say, that is absolutely able to be proven by our delivery of our actions. So today's presentation is not going to go into the how, it's going to remind us all of the why. Why are we doing this? Why are we staying committed to our industry? And why do we know that Mother Nature, having given us two years to really think about what we are doing in travel, tourism, and hospitality, why are we going to unite to make sure that we do indeed not build back better? We need to build forward better. Whenever you hear yourself using the word back, whenever you hear yourself using the word normal, stop. Because there is no back and there is no normal. We are blessed to be at a time in our industry where we have a chance to literally rebuild it the way that we know we need to, to do it ethically, 
to do it practically in an operational way that makes sense and to do it in a way that is going to last for generations to come and keeping especially young people absolutely confident. So as we have, I was going to say a drum roll to get the presentation up. I thank you very much again. And Sanchari, you are an incredible co-pilot with nerves of steel, and I'm very grateful for that. So if we move from this slide itself to the next slide. I think what's very important is recognizing that as we go to the next slide, please. We live in a world in which our world is inspired. By we have always been. We live in one of the most incredible times in how we are able to globally connect around the world in a moment. And we are able to create memories around the world based on our desires and our abilities to simply get on a plane. If we move to the next slide, please. We've seen that our world has been reopened and it's doing it in such a way that is cautious. The world is reopening in different paces around the world, but it is reopening with a vigor that is bringing people back to the airports. If we look at the next slide, please. We see that if we look around us, the airports are filling again. There are many parts of the world that it's very difficult to actually imagine that two years ago at this exact time, our airports were empty. Our runways were completely stationary. What we found, however, was in 2019, with all of the excitement that we had around the world, the industry growing between 3 and 5% for over a decade, we are responsible for 1 in 10 jobs, we were entering the roaring 20s. If we look at the next slide, we already entered the roaring 20s with such a bite because we experienced for the first time in our lives a challenge that hit everyone everywhere at exactly the same time. All of us were impacted at a physical level, at an emotional level, at a professional level. And importantly, if we go to the next slide, we were hit very much at a psychological level because all of us around the world were hit by a crisis that was invisible. Our industry, our world has never had a crisis that has hit everyone everywhere invisibly. When there is a natural disaster, Mother Nature has a temper tantrum, damage is physically done to landscapes, and then we recover. When there's a terror attack or social upheaval, and an incident takes place, and we recover. We've never had two years of sustained invisible crisis, and that has been part of what caused the trauma. If we look at the next slide, please, we saw immediately from the end of March in 2020, all of the boards of travel started to show cancellations. One of my last flights that I took place was actually in February of 2020. When I came to Mumbai, I was very grateful to be receiving an award. And just before I left, I was staying at the beautiful Dodge property in Mumbai and I was having uh, lunch with Puneet Chatwal, who we know is a very strong advocate of IAHM and one of our global champions in, in hospitality around the world. And he and I were talking about how you could feel the ground starting to shake with all of the fears around this thing, COVID-19. No one knew what it was. And suddenly, within a matter of days, he and I were not able to travel once more. Thankfully, I was able to get back to London in time. He was able to get to where he needed to. But all of our world found itself grounded. If we look at the next slide, please. We see that in terms of the challenge that we faced, it was like no other challenge before. If we look at the next slide, please, and we go to actually the top line of the impact of COVID-19, it took us back 30 years in international growth of travel and tourism. We lost almost 1 billion international rivals in 2020 alone. And most importantly, on the bottom right, between 100 and 120 million direct jobs were lost. Now, when we look at these numbers, I always think it's very, very important to not look at this as 100 or 120 million. It's one person from one family 120 million times. That is one person having to go home and say to their children, I'm so sorry, I don't have a job to go to tomorrow. We need to make sure that we're very careful about how much money we spend. We need to cancel all of those birthday presents that we planned for you. We need to manage school fees. The world went through one of the greatest shocks to its global society because of the number of direct jobs that were lost. 
Critically, and India is one of the best countries for understanding this, it's the indirect jobs. Because as we know, the impact of our sector goes far beyond those who are directly in it. If we look at the next slide, please. Immediately, we saw that all of us were leaving our offices and doing what we're doing now. We were living online from the waist up, being able to see each other, not quite know exactly how tall is Sanchari. I know how beautiful she is, but because of all of this virtual communication, I don't know how tall she is when I go to hug her when I finally see her. If we look at the next slide, we saw that restaurants around the world, bars, hospitality venues were all closing up. The next slide demonstrates what airlines looked like. Ultimately, with the seats being empty, no one wanting to travel, and even if they wanted to, no one able to travel. If we look at the next slide, one of what I think is one of the most important slides even though people couldn't commercially travel, 16,000 aircraft were grounded around the world. What we cannot forget are the heroes in aviation, because when the world shut down, there were more than 5 million people that were in the wrong place. 5 million people that were stuck somewhere because they were on holiday, because they were on business, because they were visiting someone. The airline industry, put together repatriation flights of 5.4 million people. And what's critical about that is recognizing again, in addition to getting people home, it was the aviation industry that stood up and moved doctors around the world, PPE around the world, vaccines around the world. So I'm a huge, huge fan of global aviation because if aviation isn't flying, we in the world are not going anywhere and neither is our economy, is our society, and is our health care. We move to the next slide, please. Importantly, as the world reopens and we see tourism rebuilding again and all of the yay excitement that we can travel again, what's critical for all of us to remember and what, quite honestly, even those outside of the tourism industry recognized probably for the first time is that tourism is not just about the tourists. If we look at the next slide, it's about the ripple effect. It's about that one tourist and the impact that it has on all of the people and all of the jobs around them. The next slide shows very clearly what it means. And this is what I say is the story of the egg. Now, Sanchari is my co-pilot, is also going to be my focus clearly of the presentation. So as a quick example, Sanchari leaves Bangalore and she wants to go on holiday. So she flies to the Maldives, beautiful island. She needs a break. She wants to go out by the water. She wants to just disconnect her laptop and enjoy some time off. She wakes up in the morning, she goes to the restaurant at the resort, and the lovely woman at the desk of the restaurant says, good morning, Sanchari, I hope you slept well. Let me take you to your table. That's one person Sanchari has met. Sanchari sits down and another person comes and says, Sanchari, would you like some tea or coffee? She would like some tea. They go off and they go and bring the tea. They come back and they say, Sanchari, what would you like for breakfast? And she said, I'd like an egg. Okay, how would you like your egg? Sanchari would like her egg sunny side up. So those two people she's already met, one of them knows what she wants for breakfast. The person who takes her order, the waiter at the table is person number two. Person number three is the person at the kitchen that receives the order saying that lovely Sanchari would like an egg for breakfast. The person taking the order puts the order into the lineup so that the person at the kitchen who's receiving the orders, the fourth person, can see Sanchari would like an egg. That person takes the egg and takes the order and hands it to the sous chef. The sous chef takes the, sh the egg, cracks it into the pan, and hands it to the chef. So now we're looking at six people already. The chef cooks the egg and it gets sent back to Sanchari. But the egg came from the storeroom at the back of the hotel. Someone in the storeroom brought the eggs to the kitchen for the chef to cook up. That was the seventh person. The eighth person is the person who received the eggs at the back of the hotel. The ninth person is the driver of the truck who delivered the eggs to the hotel. The tenth person is the person from the farm who provided the egg to be able to go into the truck, to go to the delivery person, to go to the hotel, to end up 
as Sanchari's breakfast. So between the chicken and Sanchari, there are 10 jobs. That's what we must never forget. It's not just about beautiful Sanchari having a lovely egg breakfast on the first day of her holiday in the Maldives. It's the 10 people that rely on Sanchari going on holiday so that they have jobs that are protected between the chicken and her breakfast. So if we look then at the next slide, please. We can never forget the impact that our industry has, especially on small medium enterprises and in women and on youth. 80% of our industry is SMEs, 80%. What happened to those people during the crisis? How, for whom were they making bread? What were the Mendy artists doing? What were all of the musicians doing? If we look at our next slide again, I go through the importance of job creation in our industry and the impact that we had between 2019, where we were one in 10 jobs, we went down to one in 12 jobs in 2020, and we're now slowly making our way back up again. If we look at the next slide in terms of economic impact, we see the massive economic impact that we have around the world. 10.3% of GDP globally in 2019, it dropped to 6%, but it's going back up again because as we've seen, the world is reopening again. Importantly, when we look at tourism and we look at the next slide, we can see that it is absolutely critical in terms of investment, in terms of building infrastructure, our next slide demonstrates how important travel and tourism is in terms of trade and export because ultimately the bellies of the planes are being filled up with cargo that needs to travel with the tourists. If we look at the next slide, it shows how important travel and tourism is to community enterprise, to keeping small businesses and especially small traditions and small ways of life thriving in this big global community. We look at the next slide and again, we look at industries that are reliant on travel and tourism and how they are able to remain true to what they are, recognizing their past as a part of their future. Very importantly on the next slide, if we look at the fact that our industry was also very critical in the protection of wildlife, making sure that travelers know that when they travel to respect wildlife to be careful and to be caring the next slide also demonstrates that our industry because we are global people we are able to keep an eye on global children our industry has always been absolutely critical when it takes care of young children making sure that they do not get pulled into illegal crime because of their simply being young and vulnerable. Ultimately, if we look at the next slide, we see how important tourism is to the identity of countries. A country like South Africa, somewhere where I lived for over 20 years, though I'm from Canada and I have Indian blood, South Africa's identity was shaped enormously post-apartheid through tourism, through hosting the World Cup in 2010, through its now being one of the strongest destinations in the world. So as we see, as our world reopens, as we look on the next slide, slowly, 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 we are seeing that travel is rebuilding. Very importantly, we're seeing that it's not just international travel, but domestic travel. And this is one of the best things that happened to our industry when we look at how it grew, because as the world reopened, we reopened first at a domestic level. Domestic tourism has always been the poor cousin of international tourism. Mother Nature is a tourism practitioner. She knew that by opening up the world again domestically, we raise the value for citizens of traveling in their own countries so that when international travel recovers, the baseline of every country's travel industry is going to be stronger. But we can see compared to every other crisis in the world, we have a long way to go, which is why it's so important we do that together. So when we look at again the next slide, we can see that parts of the world are reopening, but they're reopening at different paces. We can see that Asia and the Pacific has only just started to reopen. And what I'm finding is critical is we need to be very sensitive to everyone around the world and how they are opening up in a way that is respectful of their health care first and then their economic health. If we look at the next slide, please, again, as I say, what's fantastic is that we're seeing domestic travel is recovering, as is international travel. So all of the travel and tourism is going to grow into the next stage. 
If we look at the next slide, we have an important message that's coming from one of our world's greatest messengers about our industry and why it's so critical that we recover for the sake of the global community. If we can hit play, please. Tourism is one of the world's most important economic sectors. It employs one in every 10 people on Earth and provides livelihoods to hundreds of millions more. It boosts economies and enables countries to thrive. It allows people to experience some of the world's cultural and natural riches and brings people closer to each other, highlighting our common humanity. Indeed, one might say that tourism is itself one of the wonders of the world. That is why it has been so painful to see how tourism has been devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic. In the first five months of this year, international tourist arrivals decreased by more than half and some 320 billion US dollars in exports from tourism were lost. Overall, some 120 million direct jobs in tourism are at risk. Many are in the informal economy or in micro, small and medium sized enterprises which employ a high proportion of women and young people. The crisis is a major shock for developed economies, but for developing countries, it is an emergency, particularly for many small island developing states and African countries. For women, rural communities, indigenous peoples, and many other historically marginalized populations, tourism has been a vehicle for integration, empowerment, and generating income. Tourism is also a key pillar for the conservation of natural and cultural heritage. The falling revenues have led to increased poaching and habitat destruction in and around protected areas, and the closure of many World Heritage sites has deprived communities of vital livelihoods. It is imperative that we rebuild the tourism sector, but it must be in a way that is safe, equitable, and climate friendly. Transport-related greenhouse gas emissions could rebound sharply if recovery is not aligned with climate goals. Supporting the millions of livelihoods that depend on tourism means building a sustainable and responsible travel experience that is safe for host communities, workers and travelers. To aid recovery, I have identified five priority areas. First, mitigate the socio-economic impacts of the crisis. Second, build resilience across the entire tourism value chain. Third, maximize the use of technology in the tourism sector. Fourth, promote sustainability and green growth. And fifth, foster partnerships to enable tourism to further support the sustainable development goals. Let us ensure that tourism regains its position as a provider of decent jobs, stable incomes, and the protection of our cultural and natural heritage. Thank you. So what's interesting about that video, in addition to the fact that His Excellency the Secretary General speaks very clearly about the importance of moving on strongly and sustainably, and if we go to the next slide, please, what's critical is we have never, ever, ever had a time in our industry's life, travel, tourism and hospitality, where beyond tourism, the highest level of the United Nations, the Secretary General of the UN was speaking about the importance of tourism. And this is where, again, one of the, one of the it's not a blessing, one of the elements that's come out of COVID-19 is that the global community beyond hospitality now recognizes the importance of our industry. So now we all start talking green. Everyone's talking about sustainability. But this is where, again, I wanted to really focus our effort, our focus, our attention on this presentation. When we rethink sustainability, we have seen through the last two years, through the learning of the last two years, that sustainability is not only about green and blue. We need to recognize, if we go to the next slide, please, that sustainability has four critical dimensions to it. So whenever we find ourselves using the S word, as I call it, please remember these four elements. This is one of the most important things that has come out of this last two years. Firstly, on the next slide, it's economic sustainability. Economic sustainability must be ensured because ultimately, no matter what happens, if we don't have that economic activity, the supply chains moving, we have significant peril across our global community. Secondly, on the next slide, it's as we know, it's environmental sustainability. Third, 
On the next slide, it's social sustainability, keeping communities together, making sure that we as a society are protecting one another. And fourth, very importantly, the next slide, it's cultural sustainability. Now, I have a habit, and admittedly, that's my hand from Russell came about two weeks ago. I love getting my Mendy done. I absolutely love getting my Mendy done. And even my cousins, when I come to do work in India, if I'm in Delhi, my favorite cousin who's in Delhi, she knows that when I see her, the expectation is that we're going to go to the markets, we're getting my Mendy done. If it wasn't for travel and tourism, how many of these customs, how many of these traditions, how many of these parts of culture would even exist anymore? It's critical that we always remember when it's about sustainability, it's economic sustainability, cultural sustainability, social sustainability, and environmental sustainability. There are four vital dimensions that make sure that sustainability is holistic and it is genuine. Because if we look at the, mate, the next slide, what is absolutely critical is as we rebuild our industry, again, it's the why. The how is an imperative. Sustainability is a part of the DNA of hospitality. It's a part of the DNA of travel and tourism and aviation. It's not a project. It's not a line item. And as we build this in, as we ensure that we are sustainable, we are ensuring that our industry is protected. Because ultimately, what is the opposite of sustainable business? It's bankrupt. What is the opposite of sustainable wildlife? It's extinct. Sustainability is not a choice. It is an imperative, which is why, as I say on the next slide, when we're talking about sustainability, we need to be very, very careful that we don't do the greenwashing. Not only because it's ethically the wrong thing to do, it's also because now, having been grounded from travel for the last two years, travelers know the difference. And if we look at the next slide, it's very clear, and this is some outstanding research that was just released this week by Expedia, which is looking at 10,000 of their people that are searching online and booking online through Expedia.com. So it's a travelers who are also recognizing when they talk about sustainable travel, they're not talking about it the way they used to in 2019. Now it's about, yes, recognizing environmental impact, but they also want to know the supply chains. They want to support local economies. They want to go out and immerse themselves with local communities, knowing the local impact that will have. And they want to get out of those traditional tier one cities, those hub destinations, going further into destinations, taking the impact of their travel deeper into destinations. So the travelers are saying, we understand sustainability in a new way. We as an industry need to make sure that we understand it the same way. And when it comes to making choices, we are making choices that reflect these four areas because that is how travelers are going to ensure that we are being honest to what we are saying. I share with you now on the next slide a quote from one of my favorite leaders in the world. I've been very blessed to work in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for the last five years, involved in one of their mega projects of Alula, which is a 22,000 square kilometer footprint in the desert of a kingdom over 10,000 years old. It's an old Nabataean kingdom linked very much to the DNA of Petra and Jordan but it's magnificent. It is truly an incomparable destination. But what he says very wisely, and this is, these are quotes coming just from WTM last week. He is very clear in saying, we need to stop talking about rethinking tourism, reimagining tourism. We need to do it. And when it comes to sustainability, we need to stop talking about, talking about the, the things we are going to do. We need to act on them. Saudi Arabia has been remarkable in how during COVID it continued to build. I'm the daughter of an architect. My father taught me very much about light and space growing up just organically. And when I started going to Saudi Arabia, there was nothing built in this part of the desert. We now have there, it's a 5,000 capacity concert hall called Mariah. Mariah is Arabic for mirror or mirage and what it basically is is it's a building that is 100 percent mirror and for me as an architect's daughter to me this is the most exquisite humble example of an architect recognizing the building is not the beauty it's the landscape around it and it literally reflects every single part of that area 
in the valley where it's actually sitting, which is Ashar. It is spectacular. And so what the kingdom has been doing is recognizing when we talk about economic, social, cultural and environmental sustainability, we have to invest behind it. And as he says clearly, a lot of people talk about sustainability, but few act on it. It's a big word, but the reality on the ground is to start basics. If we want to be good for tourism, we need to deliver and invest in sustainability. And nowhere is doing that like Saudi, because ultimately, whether it's travelers or investors and even government officials, they're holding us accountable. We've been talking about sustainability. Are we going to deliver on it? So as we look to the next slide and we question what is ahead for global hospitality, there's so much we don't know. We know the crisis that we continue to experience because as we know, crisis is not linear, it's layered. There were challenges before COVID. As we work through COVID, we look at the next slide, we know that globally we have an energy crisis. The price of fuel is going up. Everyone is conscious now of heating, of travel, of mobility. We know that we look at the next slide, the price of food is going up. Global food supply chains have been impacted. Everything is being hit at a basic level. And people are saying, do they actually put money into eating? or into heating. How do we manage that? We look at the next slide and say, well, then what does that mean for travel? We know that the cost of travel has gone up enormously. If anyone understands anything in aviation, it is that it is an industry in which you do not make money. The costs of aviation are massive. When we look at the prices now of tickets, they are incredibly high. They are not high because aviation is trying to make money back. Aviation depends on fuel. The cost of fuel, as we know, has risen enormously. In addition, because of the crisis in Ukraine with Russia, the entire airspace has been blocked off since March. That challenge means that someone flying from Asia to Europe or the Americas has to go around Russian airspace, which is a longer air route, which takes more fuel, which costs more money. So all of these things are impacting travel and tourism. In addition to, as we know, significant issues we've had in hospitality, in tourism, in aviation about staffing. We lost so many people, so many, especially young people, because they couldn't trust the industry to be able to take care of them. They couldn't trust the industry to be able to protect their jobs. We need to bring those people back. We need to bring them back, recognizing not just the value of them as a, an employee, but the values they have now as an employee, really respecting their job aspirations, their career aspirations, and the fact that their well-being on the job is now vital. Bringing people back to work is not only about increasing their pay, it's increasing their feeling of worth. That is fundamentally important. So if we look at the next slide and why we can feel confident that despite all of these challenges, the world will continue to move, we can see from the slide after this, again, from this fresh Expedia uh, communication and research, that on the next slide, we see, we see the statistics of travelers saying, what is it behind their desire to travel? They need a change of scenery. They know the value of travel to their mental and physical health. They want to connect up with people again. They want to hug. They don't want to Zoom. They want to be able to spend the time, have new experiences, getting out of their comfort zones. Importantly, having new experiences also links to experiences that were missed out on. Weddings, memorials, funerals, births, birthdays, celebrations. So many events were missed. People want that back. We want the huggability of the world back. And I'm going to share with you before I wrap three executions by British Airways that were just, just, just released. And to me, the most effective advertising in the world is advertising that connects with human truths that really connects with the heart of why people travel. One of the countries that did this better than anyone in the world is Incredible India. When you launched the Incredible India campaign years ago, I remember watching it the first time I was living overseas and I heard firstly the music. You might remember when Amitabh made that campaign when he was leading the tourism industry, there was that beautiful sequence of the woman on the balcony releasing the rose petals. 
And the music, the theme for Incredible India started with the Sadegamapa. Now, I had to smile because as a Canadian daughter of Indian descent, I immediately recognized the Sadegamapa. And I thought, for anyone connected to India, they will remember that from when they learned to sing. I thought that was absolutely beautiful, and anyone with musical connections knew it. Anyone around the world who didn't know about India, they just thought it sounded beautiful. But psychologically, that campaign brought everyone in. These three campaigns have just been released by British Airways. They're very, very quick snippets. They're 30 seconds each, but I think they are communications poetry. So when we talk about why do people travel, British Airways understood the truth. If we can have the first one, please, on the next slide. Just to click on the video. And we go to the next one, please, and then hit play. And then the next one, please, and play. Such simple, simple, simple human truths. That's why we travel. And ultimately, we've seen in the last two years, as our world slowly recovers, everyone needs to travel. It's not just a want, it's a need. Because ultimately, as a human community, we are defined by travel. If we can hit play, please. Movement defines us. Standing still is not an option. We must come together again under shared values. With sustainability as a guiding principle. We are the innovators, the game changers. We are travelers. We celebrate diversity and champion solidarity. Growing back for people and planet. Unlocking opportunities for millions and leaving nobody behind. The world is waiting. We will restart tourism. And if we go to the next page, please, I say a very loving Danyavad for the chance to share this message with you, to be with you all today. And I now hand over for any questions that may be had and to our lovely moderator, Mr. Job. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, so it was really great. In fact, uh, Ms. Anita invited. It was a very informative and uh, in fact, you touched upon various aspects of the sustainability in hospitality and tourism uh, and overall industry, in fact. And I think we can clearly see in your presentation also that how it's very important, in fact, uh, for economical growth as well as the cultural heritage, you know, conservation for any country, in fact. And, and very rightly, in fact, you mentioned about the four dimension of the sustainability in tourism, because being in this particular industry, like, you know, of course, uh, I have been in the engineering industries and all, uh, we, we generally talk about the three dimensions, the environment, social and governance. But you very rightly mentioned about the very important dimension of this particular uh, sector, which is related to the cultural sustainability. I think it's a very, very important point that, you know, that any company and any sector of this particular area should focus on this area besides the environment, social and governance the dimension what we have in fact in fact you also very rightly mentioned the the very challenging areas like after covid like all the sectors like in fact not only the hospitality and tourism almost all the sectors they they, they got impacted very badly in fact and but how they have recovered 
Now, but still now the lots of challenges are there for this particular sector, as you have mentioned about the even the the energy crisis. What we are really expecting or going to be more deeper, you know, in the future also. And uh, it's really, really, very insightful. You know, we are very thankful to you for your uh, lovely presentation today. Uh, just a few questions we would like to have. Of course, we request our participants also to put the questions in chat box. And uh, we'll, of course, be taking up those questions one by one. So from my end, in fact, uh, Arita, thank you. what do you feel that like this, one of the most challenging uh, kind of sustainability aspect for this, uh, this particular sector, when we say ESG, and then, of course, we have a cultural sustainability which one you feel is one of the the most one because you have been really handling this area for so many years so it's more most challenging and kind of the area that any sector any you know specific industry should focus on mainly on this tourism and hospitality management i, I must say I'm, I'm smiling from the point of view of and i'm going to trust the um the, the, the safety of the the fact that we're all in the bubble and that we um we trust each other as colleagues I think the biggest challenge, quite honestly, is getting people to stop talking about it and do something about it. I fundamentally believe that. And that's where I always argue that Mother Nature knew what she was doing. We were growing as an industry so quickly. We were going to deal with sustainability labor later. We'll deal with labor practices later. We'll deal with DEI and equity later when we have time. And she just thought, OK, you want time? I'm going to give you time. She gave us two years to think about this. She gave us two years to come up with solid solutions that we knew we needed to do, whether it's about, I always argue that you know, we talk about no more plastic straws. We're going to have bamboo straws or paper straws. Why do we need straws? I, I really fundamentally believe we, we overcomplicate things. We think about these so scientifically and so at scale that we don't start small and find a way of creating not a campaign, but a movement. And just questioning, why are we doing this? During the last two years, businesses have had to look very carefully at their cost structures and they've cut out unnecessary costs. What a blessing is that? Because suddenly they realized they didn't have to put money into it in the first place. So I think if anything, the challenge is getting people to stop talking about what they're going to do. And exactly as you said, you said very rightly, and that's where, Rajesh, you said when you asked the question that we've been talking about for a long time. That's the problem. We need to simply do one thing, start, and then do the next, and then do the next. Because what we have established through the last two years, we are not an interconnected industry. We are not an integrated industry. We're interdependent. Because unless the aircraft is flying and the airport is open, the hotels will not get filled the tour operators will not get tourists. So by recognizing start one thing and start magnifying it, then we're going to get somewhere. But I think we're in a very dangerous position right now of talking about sustainability, but not acting on it. And that's one of the reasons why I brought the four dimensions. So one of my favorite examples of cultural sustainability, which you focused on, is the Taj Falak Numa property in Hyderabad which I went there years ago on a UN event. We had a regional commission meeting there and it was spectacular. And when they explained how so many of those palaces would not have survived if they had not been handed over to the Tata Foundation and the Taj brand to operate. So our industry, hospitality, is literally helping culture survive. That's sustainability. So by framing sustainability in a way that people can see they're already doing it, it makes it easier for people to do more. Does that answer the question? Yes, quite pertinent. And thank you very much uh, for very detailed uh, you know, explanation on this. I just another question I have. Uh, in fact, we want we we understand that you know the sustainability of uh, this mainly on the uh, you can say the environment, uh, social and governance. When we say how you think about the the kind of the value chain of this particular sector like because it's very important as you know that like we uh, it's not that we are only running like it's like the entire value chain has to come together support and then only they can make this sector successful in fact right so what about the your thought process on the value chain how any this particular sector can really help them to improve maybe you know kind of uh, maybe ghg emission scope 3 when we talk about and when we also talk about multiple other 
aspect of that even the child labor when we say that how in my value chain i can take care of certain things so what is your thought process how this particular sector should focus on the the value chain so that they can make this sector more sustainable uh, when it comes to this esg aspect also yeah indeed it's it's a great question because i think importantly i always look at the value chain as a values chain because ultimately you don't want children working. You don't want to be wasting water. You don't want to be wasting food. Food. So in the value chain, looking at again, where can you start making simple changes? Because to say that we're going to address sustainability by cutting emissions, that's a massive technical operation. So if you look at sustainable aviation, for instance, one of the challenges is that aviation is looked at as a soft target stop the aircraft flying, the skies will be blue, the birds will be singing and we'll hear them. There are 68 million people whose jobs depend on aviation. The problem is not aviation, the problem is emissions. The industry is looking and they're putting billions into emissions management through sustainable aviation fuels. The challenge is that you need fuel production at scale. That requires government funding. So while we're waiting for that to happen, there's still other things that we can be doing. So, and I think this is where, when we talk about sustainability, put it on a spectrum of in your value chain, what are the simple things you can start doing? And the larger, more complex, you can start addressing, finding solutions on. We already have some solutions because I think importantly, you can either inspire people to change nudge them to change or force them to change you'd rather inspire them to change and to me the inspiring comes from <clears throat> values in the chain so what are we already doing now what does it take to just shut the lights off when you leave what does it take uh, you know i lived in cape town for several for 20 something years and we all know that cape town had a water crisis and it was severe and you think how can a city surrounded by water have a water crisis when the water crisis happened, it became very politicized. I immediately made contact with ultimately the Office of the Presidency and said, this is not about water. This is actually about investor confidence. Because if we want to deal with the future of the country and the future as regards to crime control, you need to create jobs. You can only create jobs if you bring in investment. How do you bring in investment when there's no water in a country surrounded by water? by articulating it in a way of how do we start? One of the biggest barriers, quite honestly, is that Rajesh, one of the things that stops people from engaging in sustainability is the word sustainability. It's so Very big, true. and it's so lofty, and it's so judgmental that people think, well, we're doing something about sustainability. Who's going to say they're not? Who's not going to say they're dealing, doing something about diversity and equity? But saying it does not mean doing it. And that's where I really believe that whether we call it sustainable travel, regenerative travel, responsible travel, ESG, we need to stop saying and start doing. What are the simple things we can do by example so that we get more courage to deal with the complex? Very true, very true. In fact, like I think everyone should be start doing with a small thing and with that only they can contribute for a bigger and you know major milestones also in the future. So I think now we'll move to some of the questions what we have from our participants also. I think we uh, we have a question from Mr. Sanjay. Uh, so he's asking, are there any initiative on the international level in organization such as uh, UN WTO being spoken about regarding the issues of manpower shortage and development? So is there any, any such initiatives being taken actually? So uh, that's a question. Yeah. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful question and thank you for that because if we look at it, all of us in the hospitality industry at a career level, we probably didn't start at the bottom line of our industry. Somewhere our careers took off. Young people in the industry need the support to be able to see their future. So the UNWTO has become very active in the education space. And this is why um, the Secretary General Zura Polulikashvili has been a strong advocate of IAHM and everything you've been doing and on supporting it. So what's critical there is absolutely linking you up to all the efforts that are taking place in the UNWTO. We have all of the startup initiatives. We have a huge amount of work being done in technology 
Critically, the UNWTO Academy is there. It's a free educational platform that can be utilized. I'll send Sanchari, I'll send you the link for it so you can pass it out to everyone who's actually signed up today. It is an outstanding academy recognizing that anywhere in the world, as long as you are connected online, you can learn about different parts of the industry, whether it's about labor practices, skills, marketing, HR, whatever it might be. All of that platform is there. It is, it is at scale one of the most powerful ways of actually driving education and getting young people involved by learning the right lessons the right way, right up front. So I'll send that through, but thank you very much for that question because it was an important one. Thank you, thank you, Anita. We have one more question, in fact. So uh, do you think that uh, there have been uh, large scale traveler tourism education initiatives uh, on sustainable and responsible? So do you think there have been any large scale, in fact, any travel or education initiatives have been taken for this particular area? Indeed. So that's um, the question, in fact, yeah. I, I love the question and I'm smiling because the, the best educator in the importance of responsible travel was Mother Nature because she showed us by being grounded for two years the impact of our travel, good and bad. And so I do believe, and this is where when you look at that Expedia research, and, and Sanjari, I'll send you the full document as well. It's amazing where it's not the industry that's going to change responsible travel, it's travelers. They're the ones who are saying, I want to see Mr. Tour Company exactly how my tour price is helping the local bakery down the road. I want to see where you bought those artifacts from. I don't want to see made in somewhere else tags on curios that I'm buying. So it's the travelers who are literally wanting absolute transparency in how their money is filtering back into the destinations. That's a very good thing because, again, you can inspire, nudge, or force change. Travelers are not going to inspire us into change if we don't listen. They're going to force us into change by their decision making. And again, Mother Nature knew what she was doing. So. Very true, in fact. So we, we do have more questions. In fact, those questions we can you know separately address maybe because some, some of the questions are related to the wastewater management and all. I think we can share those case studies with our uh, participants. And uh, with this, I think uh, I really thank you, uh, Ms. Anita, for really taking us through the entire session so nicely. Very insightful, very informative, and really thanks a lot. Now I hand over to uh, Sachita for uh, the, the next level of uh, discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Sanchari, you so yeah, Sanchari, over thanks. to you, Sanchari. Yeah, please. Thank you very much, Rajesh Ji, for yeah. putting across the questions to Anita Ma'am. Anita Ma'am, always, always a pleasure. You know, you know how much I always, always look up to you, and you know, you always definitely, you know, give us so much of knowledge and inspiration by every talk that you do. You're passionate about sustainability basically encourages us and think about it and take it up so personally as the way that you always say. So, ma'am, thank you so much for taking up your time. We all know that you're extremely busy this month. I, I know especially because you've been traveling so much and it was so difficult for you to manage this time for us. We are really, really thankful to you and grateful to you, ma'am, for giving us this time today. The presentation is beautiful and I'm certain all the young minds, all the entrepreneurs, all our members of BCIC today, and definitely everyone who has been a part of this session has really been encouraged by your words, and definitely they get inspired too, to definitely feel and accept sustainability in their lives. So thank you very much, Anita, ma'am. Uh, on behalf of my entire expert committee led by Mr. Vineet Verma, in fact, Mr. Verma has given you a lot of appreciation and he couldn't be here till the end of it because of an emergency for which he had to leave. But definitely he's extremely happy, ma'am, and so are we. Thank you very much for sparing your time and being with us today, this afternoon. And whenever you're here in India, we would love to welcome you, not just at IHM, but definitely at our BCIC office too at Bangalore. So thank you very much, Anita, ma'am. On behalf of all of us, thank you very much for being here today with us. And definitely a very warm thanks to our entire audience for sparing your time and learning so much for Ms. Anita Mandrita's session, which definitely comes 
with a lot of effort because she's a very, very busy person, yet a very humble and an amazing human being that she is. Thank you very much, Anita, ma'am. I love you from Anita. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.